we're doing our hellos. We got Abby. Abby is amazing. Abby is uh, the president of the Information Architecture Institute, which is great. Uh, she is an animator <laughs> and illustrator. Uh, she is author of the book, How to Make Sense of Any Kind of Mess, especially the one you just found yourself in. Um, and she's going to speak. She's got to talk. She's going to go. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carl. That was weird. <laughs> I guess. So, I've been thinking a lot about everything recently. Uh, and by everything, I actually do mean capital E, everything. Um, the big E. To serve the theme of this year's event, I've been challenged to think through a pretty tough question to answer. Does the way that we architect information actually affect our happiness? And I think asking this question is asking a lot of things simultaneously. It's not just asking about our happiness as designers, but it's also asking about our customers' happiness, about our coworkers' happiness, and maybe even about that big we, our world's happiness. And I think that the question is challenging to answer because of this broadness that's required. And honestly, it was really hard to write a talk about something that was so big. It kind of got the gears of imposter syndrome started pretty quickly. I was sort of like, I mean, who am I to think that what I do would make people happy, especially the world, right? And it might even uh, get you boiled up about the idea of this work-life balance thing. Like, is my job as an information architect even supposed to make me happy? Or am I supposed to be seeking happiness somewhere else, outside of, of the work that I do? And I think that ultimately, there's a lot of paths that we could take away from answering this question. And after giving it a lot of thought, I started to think that many of these paths away are really based in something pretty simple and something we all share, which is fear. The fear that we might affect somebody else's well-being with what we create. The fear that something that we make or approved or funded or even marketed might not fit into somebody's life the way we expected or affect them positively. The fear that a simple decision that we make in our lives could actually be of huge impact to somebody else's lives. But this is the responsibility that we all share and we all kind of walk around with, especially if we make things for other people, which I believe all of us here today do. And with our humanity, I think we've been gifted with this connection to one another, which also means that we've been gifted with this burden, that we can affect one another with what we create, and ultimately that we do affect each other with what we create. Now, this holiday season, uh, the team at Facebook got a little bit of heat for uh, the responsibility of kind of sharing their year in review video. Did everybody catch wind of this? This was a really interesting example of a team kind of faced with one of these moral quandaries of what they're doing and its effect on other people's happiness. And as simple as it is to diagnose now in hindsight, I think that the following fact is still true. All of that drama could have been avoided if one Facebook employee would have said the question that had to be in everybody's mind when they were discussing. Somebody had to have thought, maybe somebody's year wasn't awesome. How is this going to make them feel? And I have to believe that somebody had that question because we're all human and we all know somebody who's not having an awesome year just like we all know someone who is having an awesome year. So it really comes down to the environment that Facebook is working in and that those designers go to work in every day. Are they able to ask questions like that? Are questions like that prioritized the same way questions of profitability are questioned? And I think from the result, we can all make assumptions about what did and did not happen in that room. But we can also know that if somebody did answer, ask that question, it wasn't answered with responsibility of thinking about other people's happiness. It was answered with methods of profitability. So 
So I think that this is important because there's lots of examples like this. And these are not investments of technological uh, means that are missing here, right? This is not a social marketing faux pas or a place for the data model to improve in the future. These are mishaps of understanding. These are people not asking questions about the impact of their work and instead asking questions only about the usability and viability of it. And I think that this is perhaps forever to be known as a great case study of when teams ask, could we, when they don't quite ask, should we, first. And their impact on the world, I mean, it's just proven by the numbers of people that they touch in their daily lives with very personal content. So I believe that people want that they can wrap their head around when it comes to everything. I believe you're living in a time when things are as complicated as we've ever dealt with, and we're looking onto a time when it is only going to get more complex. And I really believe that when it comes down to it, our version of everything is a combination of the information that we pull in towards ourselves and that which is pushed at us by other people over time. And there's perhaps no two scarier concepts than information and time. But they are the medium that we deal with in information architecture. And information can make us happy as easily, or perhaps not as easily, as it can make us unhappy. And there's a lot of very basic reasons that we as information architects understand about this reality and why this is so. We know that information belongs to us each individually, yet we work in service of people that want to affect other people's version of information. They want to get inside the heads of other people. That's a very sensitive place to be. We know that information can make sense to us as the creators while not necessarily making sense to those who we wish to impart it upon. And that can be a real struggle not only to identify, but also to admit to yourself as the creator of something that you're hoping will have impact on other people in a certain direction, and you realize that it maybe doesn't. And we all know that information has a time and place where it is useful, and conversely, we have times and places where information can be hurtful or not useful for us, given our context. And while information always comes from a source, the truthiness of that source sort of affects the quality of what ends up in each of our minds, right? I mean, that's really crazy to me to think about. Um, and that idea that we, at the end of the day, don't really know why we think we think. I mean, we think we have control of what's going on up here, but do we? Do we know where it comes from? Do we know why? And ultimately, I think the most important point of all this is that information changes what we know. And therefore, it does change who we are as people. I think that information ultimately is our unique version of everything. And that is the capital E everything, not just the things that you're consuming in your digital spaces, the everything of your life. And I think that our unique version of everything ultimately changes the content that we make for other people to consume. Whether that's content that we are making to you know, market a product, put out a service, or just having a conversation with one another, or perhaps presenting to a room of people like I am right now. And our content is ultimately experienced in context and it's interpreted by our audience. We don't get control of what happens once it goes into the meat grinder of someone else's mind. It's no longer ours. It's not our content any longer. It is now their information. It's theirs uniquely. And this affects their unique version of everything. This moves bits around in their mind about how they think of the world. And maybe it's just me, but affecting other people's version of reality seems like a really freaking important thing that we should all be taking very seriously. And I don't believe that it's just lip service to the theme. I absolutely believe that this is what we all do when we practice information architecture. We affect other people's version of everything. And I do think it's important. I think it's incredibly important. 
So today, I want to show you some of my personal IA work for clients and for myself. Um, and I'm hoping to show you this through the lens of ways that I think that you can practice information architecture in pursuit of happiness. So the first way is what I like to call visualizing my version of reality. So the fact that everyone has their own unique version of what's going on in the world can be something that you ignore or something that you entirely embrace with your process. I think to be successful as an information architect, I have had to learn over time to embrace other people's version of the world, maybe even putting my own aside, which can be really tough. I think the first step to that is actually to make a map just for yourself. So this is a map is actually not meant to be shown to people. And it may seem like a crazy mess to somebody else, but to be the difference between you admitting what you know about a subject or keeping it all up here in your right? So visualizing that mental model that you're starting to develop over time about what it is that you're working on or organizing your findings along your process in a deliverable that only you see can be a really powerful way to check in with your own biases, your own kind of construct of hierarchies, um, and sort of where you're moving towards uh, in terms of your work. I find that this is a really successful way um, to take notes, actually, is, is through sort of like this association diagram type of uh, template. So once you have a map for yourself, it's really about showing them what they know. And your version of who they and them are is you know, totally up to the project context that you're in. But it's even if it exists only in people's minds, that we've spent some time getting it out of their minds and onto a wall of some sort so they can confront whatever is going on there. Um, this example specifically is me helping a small startup with their menu. Uh, they are a food-based startup and they have a, a menu system. And at the time that I came in, they had more categories than they actually had products. Uh, and if you're an IA, you will know that that is a really bad idea. Just don't do that. And they all knew this, but they had never actually been confronted with the list. Uh, they had it in a spreadsheet. It was even on their website. But they had never had to sit in a room and recall all the categories for a stranger and have this running long list of post-its in front of their face. And it really got them starting to think about the conversation differently. So don't be afraid to physicalize what they know. The next thing, and you know, similar to the post-it exercise, is to get people ready to work in low fidelity by getting them used to that over time. Um, I like to use a lot of very low fidelity techniques in terms of using conversations and drawing at the same time to illustrate a concept. Um, those kinds of things let the client or your colleague know that you're looking to collaborate with them. You're not coming to kind of deck, slide, deck, slide, deck, slide through something that you've already thought about that's already kind of baked in terms of the fidelity. Um, and it really, I find, changes the nature of the conversation if you're able to maintain low fidelity for as long as possible. With that, and the number one question that I get asked is, how do you find uh, the time with clients to make large decisions on IA? And I think the important point is that you do find the time and the space, and that you don't allow the process to be rushed. Uh, because often, this actually is something that you might be working on, that it has a cognitive load that just can't be handled in a single meeting. And that is OK. We have problems that are that big. Uh, the app wraps an entire conference room in Portland, Oregon, and it sat there for three months. Uh, and every two weeks, I would, and we would have some meetings, and I'd have a new group of people, and then I'd revisit with the people that I worked with the last time, and we iterated through it. And it really did take the dedicated space and time to get through the assignment. There was just no way that any one person could hold all of that detail in their head. Uh, and I see too many people getting put through the ringer of trying to get everything done in a two-day discovery workshop. Right? This doesn't always work. Sometimes you need to actually pull out the, the, the calendar and plan months instead of weeks, which I know sounds scary, but some things really are that big. Coming out of a process like that, it's really important that you don't just leave it at that low fidelity, right? Having the experience of a consultant coming in and working through a map like that does not put the map into the head of every person that I worked with, nor does it allow a new person who just got hired to understand what the heck just happened. So another part of this is to really give them something to point to, right? And 
you need to have some kind of uh, knowledge transfer of whatever it is. So getting it off of the wall or the whiteboard and onto something that can be referenced past the life of the project. And this is a point that I do feel like I have to make to uh, people that work in digital specifically. Sometimes paper is actually a very powerful tool to use in your process. And specifically, I will give you the wisdom of the big paper. So if you get out the big paper and you print something and you put it on a wall in somebody's office, they literally cannot ignore it. It's just like this magical superpower of posters. Print designers have known this for years, right? So we need to start to understand as information architects, how are we representing things at the big paper perspective? How are we getting it to be part of the, the office culture even? The next way that I think we can architect information in pursuit of happiness is through better question asking. Uh, I spend a lot of time uh, at SBA where I teach with my students on how to ask better questions. I find that there's uh, ways to ask questions that sets you up for exploration and ways that kind of sets you up for box checking that you ask the question and like the due diligence question asking. Um, so I really encourage people to get very exploratory um, and borderline annoying with the question asking at a certain point. So the first tool that I love to teach around questions is something that comes from the work of Richard Saul Werman, who also coined the term information architecture. Um, he thought about performance continuums and this idea that there isn't really this aspect of black or white, yes or no, first place, second place, a lot of design conversations that we have. So he talks about enabling how much and yet in our conversations. And I think performance continuums allow you to do that. They allow you to acknowledge that sometimes we need a system that both generates leads and sells more products. And it's just a matter of balancing how much of one versus the other we have to provide a design solution towards. Along with this tactic, I find it really helpful to have people use this tool to visualize gaps in their own agreement. So if we were to be working on a company that had different factions in-house, something from marketing versus something from technology, you might use an exercise like this to get them to kind of see how little they agree or perhaps how much they agree on certain aspects of the business. Uh, and I find that this is a really powerful tool to actually use anonymously, where you kind of set yourself up as the person who tallies everybody's votes, so you know who voted what, but the people that you present it to don't. They just see this spread of disagreement. The secret here is that everybody knows where they personally sit. So they get to, in that moment of being presented to, decide, do I keep my position or do I actually change my to go in favor of, of what everyone else is going for. So I find this to be a really helpful way of kind of bringing balance uh, to difficult conversations especially. One of the key tactics uh, in terms of uh, kind of facilitating large groups and question asking would be to start with what I like to call simple node questions. So anything that you can ask somebody that they would be able to like rapid fire answer, um, and even better, kind of rapid fire right onto a pad of post-its. So you can kind of get lots and lots and lots of things out of their head without any judgment, right? So a good getting kind of simple node question would be, uh, who are the users that we serve, right? And everybody sort of has their list of top five, top seven, top ten, based on where they're coming from in the company. So getting everybody's version of that list out of their head and then onto a wall so you can sort of see where it goes. And then over time, leveling up the question that you actually are asking them to do. So the complexity and the cerebral load of asking something like, how much more important is this person than this person, um, is the secondary type of question. That's something you sort of have to warm up to. You have to get to the room and get people a little bit comfortable. Um, and also having the material to sort of physically move the post-its around and say, this person, this person, uh, it tends to really make people uh, make a decision and come to agreement. I've been for a while wondering if my work in information architecture would be applicable to my personal life. Uh, and recently, about a year and a half ago, I transitioned uh, for a bit away from consulting work because I wanted to write a book about information architecture. And I was very concerned about that moment and there was a lot of anxiety. Um, and so I decided to sort of check in with myself, myself using performance continuums. And one of the things that I really discovered here is that this is a really 
tool outside of business. Um, and I, I didn't really think about that, but just having kind of moments with myself about the role of free time versus actual free, for example, made me feel a lot more confident making decisions about what I wanted to do um, in, in my future, right? How I was gonna spend this time. And with that, I also uh, decided to do something that I do with my clients, which is ask the same question over time or and over again until somebody gives me the answer, usually that first and then over time. Um, I set up a Google form that asked myself questions about how many hours I wrote that week, if I had a speaking engagement that week, uh, and then this was my favorite, what was my mood that week, uh, described with emoticons. And it turned out at this point in, in the process, I was 67% happy, which actually on a really bad day, that made me feel really good to just know that like there, there's a blue sky up there above those clouds. And that brings me to my third way. Um, I think that digital projects, physical projects, uh, it doesn't really matter what kind of projects. If there are people involved, there is complexity involved. And with complexity comes anxiety and uncertainty. And I think that it's part of our job in doing information architecture work that we start to alleviate people's anxiety and that we get them ready for the idea of the fact that there is uncertainty in this work. There is not an answer that I am not giving you and making you search for yourself. We are really searching for this answer together. And I think that actually a, a really critical point in our process to kind of build in those alleviation moments where we can say, it's okay, it's supposed to be like this. One of the simplest ways that I find I can practice information architecture for another human is to make buckets. Just take what they have and make smaller buckets of it and somehow anxiety is alleviated. Um, only just slightly, but still alleviated nonetheless. Uh, so this is an example from the IA Summit last year. I was one of the chairs for that wonderful event, but there is a lot to do, especially in the last month. And this is um, a note card system that I developed to sort of prove to myself that there really weren't that many things on this massive to-do list. And it turned out that when I broke it down by categories like audience that I was serving or the event that it was attached to, there really were never more three or four things that I had to get done in order to kind of complete that bucket. So it sort of created this completionist mindset for me and really got me through that last month. Along with that, I think that visualizing anything is really powerful uh, in the alleviation of anxiety, but I think that visualizing data relationships specifically can really help people, especially if you're working with non-technology people. They can sort of build up these technology monsters in their mind of this data model completely uncontrollable and could be drawn of paper. And generally, I am able to draw it on a piece of paper, and I don't consider myself very special. It's just the act of getting over the anxiety of not being able to and going for it. So this is a, a good example of two uh, of the business we're fighting about needing two different technology systems, one for B2B and one for B2C, because they were convinced that their models were just drastically different. What turned out to be the case is that they had a basket of synonymous objects, really bad labeling consistency. So it, it ended up that only these four uh, colored things that were the like sh only in the B2B system and it made no sense for them to invest si significantly in differentiating the system because of that. Um, but if you got people in a meeting, they could have a whole hour and a half long meeting arguing about, but what about this field? But what about this thing? But what are we gonna do with the, this thing? How are we gonna move that over? And uh, is something that they can actually just look at and be like, oh, it's just that, okay. We could just do that. Um, I also think that there's a lot of power in enabling them to play with the options. So it might sound silly, especially if you're working on a really big project, to design a taxonomy using post-it notes in a room with 30 people. I actually find that that is way more successful than going into a room of 30 people and presenting a taxonomy I think will work for them. And that has generally been my experience. And I've done it both ways. I, I was uh, pressured into doing it the, uh, the way where you come in with kind of a straw dog many times in my career. And still there are times when you sort of have to do that based on the allotted. But if you can, if you can get in there and allow people to actually affect those changes themselves, you can have a lot of power um, and a lot of effect very quickly on the agreement level 
and how likely they are to go into like version 35 of their maps later on. Along with the anxiety and uncertainty, most of the things that uh, people like us are brought in to do involve an adjustment, right? And the adjustment that usually has to happen over time. We're working on e either a complete like redesign of something or even an iterative plan to improve something. Either way, we have this element of time and adjustment coming back into the fold. So I think that one of the ways that we can help with that adjustment and one of the most powerful ways as information architects that we can kind of work in the world is to fight the semantic dragons. Those words kick somebody off or make somebody else's ears shut off or the words that businesses are using over and over externally when they really don't make any sense to and that they, they're kind of obfuscating the truth externally, right? So getting into this idea of being able to fight those battles, knowing that they're going to happen and not talking it up to um, semantics, right? It is just semantics. It's an incredibly important form of rhetoric, the words that we choose. So I've been working with companies a lot on a template of words we don't say, and it's something that coming out of a workshop exercise, you can kind of quickly develop a sense of where their semantic dragons are based on what are the words that their employees think we should no longer say anymore? Uh, things that get locked up in the words we don't say would be history, right? Like old projects that didn't go so well. Um, people who used to work there but don't anymore and they used to call that thing that thing. Um, acronyms that have been changed over time so many times that they're completely meaningless to whatever process. I mean, things really just come out of the woodwork if you look at the words that we absolutely do not say. I think that we can also use information architecture to assist in planning for things like phases and, and projects and releases or whatever the word is that your context dictates. Uh, there's a lot of adjustment that's necessary in some cases to move a group of people from working one way to working to another way or even to get the same group of people to hit a different thing every single month as we do in, in more an agile uh, time frame. So making simple objects of discourse that allow people to discuss projects might seem like a simple act, but it is an act of generosity because there are way too many conversations that happen when people are just like talking with their hands about projects. And ultimately that's like people's lives. It's like evenings they're not going home because somebody planned badly, right? So we can step in, we can visualize these overlaps. We can make the Gantt chart and not want to make people stab their eyes out, you know, whatever it takes to kind of make that happen. And we can visualize changes. Uh, this is one of my favorite camera phone pictures I've ever taken as an IA. I can't tell you who it's for, so I've blacked out details. But I like that in this, we've obviously made one decision during the meeting, and that is that module is out. And module has actually been relegated down here, which I kind of wish like, it had like a little dunce cap or something. Like this is such a dramatic moment that is captured only in this picture. Um, but it's an important one. This was a conversation that maybe wouldn't without that piece of paper and that marker. It could have just been like another, well, we'll figure it out, or I'll send you an email, we'll have a meeting about it, we'll figure it out. But no, module's out, down there, gone. Marker said so. And I think that's a really important moment that we can enable for people. Um, I always tell my students that the person that picks up the marker first owns the meeting. So think about whether or not you're picking up the marker in your next meeting. And we can visualize intent. So back to that performance continuum tool, we can show people not only where they want to go, but we can also allow them uh, the adjustment knowledge to know that they have so far to travel, right? So setting up a visualization of here's where we're at today and here's our goal across a couple different performance continuums can really allow us to uh, prioritize the scope of what we might do next. and leave room for real-time data. Uh, this is from the IA Summit last year. Uh, we had a team on site that was very excitingly reaching the sellout biggest number ever moment. So we had this poster that was tracking the attendance over time and you can see the little, little string that we could move moment as we sold more tickets. Um, and things like this are really powerful, they're important. When people have numbers that they're working towards, giving them a place to check in with that number, giving them a place to actually visualize the impact that they're having in as you know, quick to real time as possible can be really motivating. 
And the fifth and final way that I think that we can IA in pursuit of happiness is to give the gift of clarity. I know that sounds really hippy-dippy, but it is what I wrote on my badge in terms of what I do to make people happy. And I think ultimately that is what we do. We take things that aren't clear to people and we make them clear to people. And I think that at its simplest form is a beautiful act of generosity and a gift. I think that we can visualize opportunities for people. Um, this is a, a quadrant diagram that I did a few years back for Sharpie. They were working on a redesign of their entire brand. Um, and this diagram allowed them to understand that if they were to make the move to redesign their website towards a totally different demographic, that they were going to be doing so, so in the hero's position, as opposed to the very crowded position that they were currently in. So this was sort of like sealing the deal on an otherwise very successful marketing campaign that then got turned into a very successful digital strategy. I think we can also use this kind of work to teach. Uh, this is actually the most recent thing in this deck. This is from last week at my, at my class at SVA. I've been really struggling with how to get my kids to talk to each other about their diagrams. Uh, so I, I made up this bingo game, and it has all of these kind of heuristic principles about diagramming. And it allowed them to really open up. They, there was sort of like this relief, uh, this moment of clarity around their own diagrams, which really tickled to see, because I didn't actually have to say much, which was really great. And I think that oftentimes, uh, we are the ones that are able to visualize something that is truly hard to explain, that thing that people get frustrated about even trying to explain, right? Um, but there's a lot of responsibility in that. I really like to use this example. This is a diagram that I did to visualize something hard to explain for one audience that actually ended up biting me in another audience case. This is a process diagram that represents 96 weeks of time, very important for the word problem part of this. So 96 weeks of time that it takes from the time that a designer comes up with a new idea when it is actually in you the consumer's life. 96 weeks, right? So it's a really complex process. It involves a lot of steps, but I was able to get it down to this diagram for the purposes of the executive committee understanding what it was that we were actually trying to serve in terms of a technology project that was being sold in. So this is a truthy diagram in that it represents the process, but what ended up happening is I started to overhear conversations that were talking about how this is a very linear process. We could probably use a time-based flow metaphor for the software. And so they started to have conversations about how, you know, it would be like, log in, week one, welcome to week one. In week one, you should do these things. These are the documents you need in week one, right? And, and they all thought this was like the best idea possible. But that 96 weeks thing was really bugging me. And I was like, that just doesn't seem right. So I looked into it, and I did the math and the well, duh, of the whole thing. In 96 weeks, it is not an employee's job to get one season to market. It is their job to stagger upwards of seven, eight seasons, depending on where they are in a year, on top of each other at different points in that same process. So we republished the diagram to look like this. So this is meant to inspire realistic thinking, not simplistic thinking. And when you look at this diagram, it is very clear that a time-based welcome to week one would be very flat. It would be more like welcome to week one, welcome to week seven, welcome to week 12, welcome to week 15. And everybody knows interfaces that you can tell that nobody did this level of digging on, right? It, it happens. We can uh, make diagrams that make things so simple that we actually design ourselves into a Another, and um, I'll, I will leave you with this example, is um, paying attention to context of use. Uh, so this is uh, meant to represent a schematic, or the idea of a schematic. All of the examples in my book are of pizza, so that you can consider that a sales tactic. Um, makes you hungry. The reason I like this diagram is because it is fine for showing a cute diagram of pizza, but if I was to ask somebody to make pizza, who had never seen pizza before from this diagram, where would they put the cheese? Would they put it with the sauce? Like stir it up and then, ooh, that'd be weird. Or would they put it like maybe the cheese and then the sauce? Like how would they actually balance that? And the reason I like to use this example is I don't think that anybody's gonna be like using diagrams to make 
pizza this way, but I do think that often we hand over things called wireframes, for example, that might not have the details of how the thing actually comes together and the construction part. And there's really important details that can be lost in that, and assumptions kind of fill that void. And when assumptions fill that void, you've got the cheese and the tomato sauce all mixed together on top of the pie, and everybody knows it doesn't make for good pizza. So to fix this, we would probably need to help them understand the process as well as the result, right? So there's certain ways of diagramming things that you can actually get around this quandary and identify it as something that might happen as, you know, a problem with the way that you've diagrammed something. And you can work around that and really give people the gift of clarity about the process as well as what they're making. <clears throat> So, to finish this off, um, I hope that today I have left you with five ways that you can practice information architecture in pursuit of um, I hope that none of this seemed overly scary or like something you couldn't do in your actual life. Um, I think that it's really important that we have these skills. Uh, whether or not you know, we use them is sort of our choice. So, visualizing reality, questioning everything, alleviating anxiety, helping people to adjust, and gifting clarity. So I guess I do believe that if we practice IA more thoughtfully, we actually can make people happier. Um, but there's something more important that I believe about that. That is that information architecture is absolutely not just for information architects. And stronger still, if you are making things, you are already practicing information architecture. So that's sort of an important responsibility that we all share. And I guess I wish that I could make this easier, but it's not. This really long winding road between not knowing something and knowing it, and the road just gets bumpier when you start to ask questions like, what is your impact on humanity? But I think that when we do go down that road, we have so many opportunities where we could just look back and we could just turn and not go in that direction. And I think that we can face forward and walk forward together uh, and get to a much happier place. Um, I hope that all of you will architect better information in the future as a result of hearing this. Um, and I hope that you will direct your questions and things about information architecture to the Information Architecture Institute. Um, the choice is yours, just like everything. And thank you. <laughs> questions? Do we have time for questions? We do. We have time for questions. Does anybody have one? If not, I'll do an annoying PSA about the IA Institute. <gasps> Rebecca, hello. Give me your question, lady. Um, that you diagrammed about the, the process in the, of the next weeks, and you realized that, that the client had started to make some assumptions that were maybe too simplistic. Um, how did you even introduce the second diagram? What did that conversation look like? I, first of all, wish that it had been the client that I had to have that conversation with. It was the UX team. So, uh, so it was a much different conversation. Luckily, it was something that was resolved before the client got into it too much. Um, but it was definitely one of those like, hey guys, just so you know, it's not actually like this, it's like this. So ask permission to make the diagram. That was like the first thing. Um, it took like, 10 minutes to make that second version of the diagram. Like just, it's all it is is copying and pasting and staggering boxes. So it's like, I just did it. And once I showed it to them, it's sort of, and this happens all the time, you can't unsee it. You can't like unsee truth. It's a, no, don't show me the truth. It, it just doesn't work that way. So once they saw it, they were like, oh crap, that flow thing's not gonna work. We gotta go back to the whiteboard. And that was fine. It was early enough in the process. Cool, yeah. that makes sense, thanks. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? No. Peter. I love this. In New York, I know people's names. It's so cool. Obviously, not everyone... I mean, I, I would imagine one of the things you keep running into is like, oh, I'm not an artist. I can't draw, blah, blah, blah. So, like, what's your favorite sort of, like, no, really, you can do this, even if you didn't go to SVA, uh, sort of thing to sort of get people to, like, 
make shapes and squiggles and not be self-conscious about it doesn't look perfect. Yeah. I think that there is um, the kind of making the point of we are working right now versus I am presenting to you kind of does half of that job because you're allowed to be messy. I mean, my handwriting on those post-its, I hope that that didn't come off as I'm like carefully architecting every letter and like doing sketch note styles on all my, like that doesn't happen in real meetings. You're like barely spelling the word and it's trailing off the thing. And so I think getting people comfortable with the fact that this is not me creating some sort of design theater in front of you. This is actually me doing my work and we're, we're cognitively working here. This is just, this is just our, our map. Um, I think kind of like making that a part of your setup might help. Yeah. Um, in terms of learning to draw, anyone can draw. And my number one piece of advice for people who want to get better at drawing is use a thicker marker. Everybody looks better when they use a thicker marker. Seriously, if you really can't draw, get a really thick marker. It will look so much cooler. I promise. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, stand up so I can see you. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned that it's it's a long, winding road from not knowing to knowing, and there are a lot of bumps on the way. And I realize this is probably the subject of your book, but what do you do when you're totally lost in the sauce? Oh, yeah, the bog. Um, well, the first step is admitting that you're there. Uh, finding people to help you to get out of it would be another thing. So if you are feeling like you're going it alone, uh, even if it's somebody who's not involved in the context that you're in, just like verbalize for them what's going on while drawing them a picture of the dragon that you're facing in your mind. I find that that actually helps a ton. Usually when I allow somebody to do that, they walk around thinking I am really smart when really everything just came out of their mouth and out of their hand. And it's like, okay, great, I had you draw a dragon and you now think I'm great. So I would, I would definitely try that with yourself. Like try to put yourself in the position of finding someone who can sort of be that audience for you to have that moment. Zero, we're done. Okay. You're done. Okay, find me after. Uh, also, I have books to sell. So if you would like to buy a book, find me during the break and we will make that happen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, and we keep going, and we keep going, and we keep going. All right, so next up, we are very excited to have...